Previously, on a very special episode of Cinema Mechanics, a new sponsorship meant a new challenge, and a novel new piece of filming equipment was born. There were highs, and there were lows. Yeah, what is happening? And even more lows. So this is gonna take a real rethink. And Steven was sad. But a glimmer of hope lay just beyond the horizon. And you, the viewers, were absolutely riveted. And now, for the thrilling... <coughs> Sorry. So yeah, I'm trying to combine a counterbalance slider with a camera jib to get the best of both worlds. And I already built version 1, and the design went something like this. Put the camera on one side of a slider rail, and put an equal amount of counterweight on the other side, and connect them with a belt. Then put a pivot partway down the rail so that the whole thing can jib up and down. And then counter that offset center of mass with some weights at the end of the jib. Easy peasy. But my previous design let me down when I neglected to account for the center of mass being offset from the pivot point. And if you want to know more about all that, go ahead and watch my previous video. But for now, suffice it to say that the jib doesn't jib, and won't hold position when tilted up and down. So I need to do a major redesign, and unfortunately that means I need to remake pretty much every single part. But luckily, returning sponsor Bamboo Labs and their H2D printer are here to help me out. So there's a fair amount to do, so let's get started, and I'll explain the changes as I go. So first off, I need to widen the rails a bit. So I designed some new spacers and some new jigs to help keep everything aligned. And these were printed in Bamboo's ABS glass fiber, because I haven't tried it before, and I thought it would be interesting to experiment with. And it's good stuff. Tough, heat resistant, and it's super easy to print on the H2D, which features intelligent chamber heating and adjusts the internal temperature based on the material being used. And this makes printing warp prone materials like ABS a breeze. And the reason we're widening out the rails is to accommodate another belt running alongside the first one. And this second belt will be running one third of the speed of the first one. So this means I need a mechanism that can accommodate independently tensioning each belt. I printed the pulleys in this glorious lime green glass fiber reinforced PA6 nylon from Bamboo. It has many of the benefits of CF nylon, but the surface texture isn't quite as rough. And I'm doing this not only for the extra durability, but also to test this filament out for another application. And I just have to say that the H2D quick change nozzles are awesome here. I do most of my printing with a 0.6 nozzle to increase the strength and printing speed of the large structural parts. But pulleys and gears have fine details that can really benefit from a 0.4 nozzle. So it's really handy to be able to change the nozzle without any tools and just get to printing. Anyway, the printed shaft was pressed into the pulley. And the shaft will ride on these small flanged bearings. The pulley housing is a sort of clamshell design that clamps around the pulleys. The shafts were tapped to allow a bolt to run through the center to help give the shaft some extra support and some grooves in the side plate allow the pulleys to independently slide while staying aligned with each other. The two pulley housings slide between the rails, then the end cap was screwed down to the end of the rails, and four bolts run through the end cap and connect to the pulley housings, and tightening and loosening these bolts will slide the pulley to adjust the belt tension. So before moving on to the other side, I need to make some new carriages, and these are more or less the same as my previous design, but widened to accommodate the new rail spacing and I printed these out in PET GCF just to give them a little upgrade in the stiffness department. The wheel bearings and the furniture spacer shafts were installed onto the camera carriages, and both carriages were slid on the rails. So with the carriages installed, it's time to address the motor side, and I need to get the belts to move at different speeds, and the easiest way I can think of to do this is with some gears. But herring bone gears like these bad boys are usually pretty pricey. But these nifty green meanies ended up being like two to three bucks a pop. But the big gears need to be printed with support, and nylon supports are tough to remove. But it turns out that ASA is actually incompatible with nylon. So the H2D's dual nozzles came to the rescue. I printed the models and main support structures in the glass fiber nylon, but the interface layer was ASA, and this ended up working great. The ASA doesn't come off as easily as PLA and PETG, but it does leave a really clean surface, so mission accomplished. So what are all these gears for? Well, as I mentioned before, the second belt is going to be running at a third the speed of the first one. And I'm doing this because my plan is to increase the amount of counterweight by 3x. So the whole issue with my previous design is that my center of mass is not aligned with the pivot point. 
And one way I could solve this would be to offset the counterweight from the rail. But the camera is a fair distance from the rail, so a counterweight of equal mass would have to be offset that same distance to achieve equilibrium. And this is inconvenient for a variety of reasons. But if the counterweight mass is increased by 3x, then it only needs to be offset a third of the distance to keep the center of mass centered over the pivot. And this keeps it nice and compact. And to keep everything balanced horizontally, the counterweight now just needs to move a third of the distance of the camera carriage. So in order to get this 3x reduction, we need the gears. So I came up with what I thought was a pretty elegantly simple arrangement. The motor would have a 20 tooth gear that would mesh with this 60 tooth gear on shaft number one. So a three to one reduction to give the motor some extra torque. And this shaft would also contain the pulley that drives the camera carriage. Further down, another 20 tooth gear meshes with the 60 tooth gear on shaft number two. And the pulley on shaft two drives the belt for the counterweight carriage. Once again, at a nice three to one reduction. And conveniently, shaft two already rotates in the opposite direction, which is exactly what we need for a counterweight, right? Right? So CNC Kitchen recently did a great video on using nylon 3D printed parts. And well, let's just say that I knew creep was a thing, but I really didn't know how bad the problem was. So I figure if this structure is gonna be load bearing, why not experiment with something that shouldn't have this issue? So these parts were printed in bamboos, P-E-T-C-F. And printability is great, and these parts are really strong and heat resistant. It's really amazing to have the ability to print these kinds of engineering grade materials on the H2D. The nozzle goes to 350C, the bed hits 110C, and the chamber can actively heat to 65C. And this makes the printer ideal for printing parts that can take abuse, far beyond what you'd think possible for a 3D print. I started by installing the end cap onto the rails. The end cap features a cutout that allows the belts to pass through to the gearbox. The two halves of the shaft were pressed together. Then the bearings were installed at each end. Optimistically, I didn't add any adjustability for the fit between the two shafts, but luckily the spacing ended up perfect and the gears meshed beautifully. A U-shaped bracket supports the far end of the second shaft while still providing clearance for the motor. Then the whole assembly was bolted together. and that's the gearbox ready to go. So I just need to install the belts and then I can get to testing. The belt around shaft one connects to the camera carriage. And the belt was tensioned using the adjustment screws. The belt for shaft two connects to the counterweight carriage. So I was feeling really good after getting the belts all run and was ready to start testing and Oh my god, are those carriages both running in the same direction? Well, so much for my genius plan. So the two shafts run in the opposite direction, which intuitively sounds right, until you realize that the carriages are actually riding on opposite sides of the pulley, and therefore both shafts actually need to run in the same direction for all this to work. So yeah, the elegant gearbox is out the window. So with the deadline fast approaching, I was once again dead in the water with nothing to show for my efforts. I could redesign the gearbox to add a reversing gear, but I really don't want to deal with all the complication and drag that this solution would provide. So I'm going to follow the footsteps of many a startup and pivot. And like those startups, I'm going to do what a whole bunch of you had suggested I do in the first place. I'm just going to fix all this in software, which actually might come with a lot of benefits, but I'll explain that in a second. First, I need to make some revisions to the hardware, and since I really don't want to have to reprint all this, I'm going to try and be a bit surgical. And wouldn't you know it, I'm already at over 380 hours of printing. Where does the time go? So I figured now might be a good time to give the H2D a tune-up and try out Bamboo's Vision Encoder Plate. And this thing is pretty neat. It consists of a special build plate, but it's not for printing. Instead, it's specially printed with hundreds of encoder marks, and the printer can scan this build plate and essentially recalibrate itself back to factory perfect. The printer is amazingly accurate straight from the factory, but it's great to have the peace of mind that it's going to stay that way as time goes on. So with the printer ready to go, I could move forward with the new design. And really all I need to work on is the gearbox. First off, the gears and the two shafts have to go, but I do like the gearing for the motor interface, so that's gonna stay. And for the counterweight belt, I'm just gonna add another motor. And this will just be a mirror image of the gearing that drives the camera carriage. 
so the gearbox design was tweaked and the necessary parts were printed out. And I redesigned the shafts to no longer need supports, instead opting for a slip-on design that worked perfectly. With the two shafts ready to go, I could get to building the rest of the assembly. I had noticed a bit of binding in the first assembly, so this time around I changed a few things up to aid in alignment. So now the end caps have grooves, and this keeps the mid plate on center. The top and bottom plates are also keyed to help keep the whole assembly square. And instead of building the gearbox on the rail, I built it on the bench so I could use the flat-ish surface to aid alignment. Since the shafts run right up next to each other, I opted to just put a spacer between the two end bearings and basically just let the two shafts support each other. And with the gearbox all bolted together, it was now time for me to take it apart. Well, at least the end cap. Which was then bolted on to the end of the rails. And then the gearbox assembly was slipped onto the end cap and everything was re-bolted together. And my efforts to keep everything aligned seems to have mostly paid off since the shafts now run quite freely. So after running the belts to the two carriages, I was finally back on track and could finish up the jib portion of the build. which mostly consisted of widening out the base of the pivot, which is now printed in CF Pet G with the now familiar PLA supports. It's honestly amazing how quickly I'm starting to rely on this feature. I'm using the same thrust bearing and radial bearing arrangement as in my previous design. And if it ain't broke... So the side plates were bolted on to complete the pivot, and that's the mechanics pretty much ready to go. But I can't get to testing just yet, because this whole thing requires a bunch of electronics to make it work. So I need some sensors, wiring, and some other bits and bobs. So first off, I printed up a mount for the O-Drive. And this O-Drive can run both motors, so I only need to run power and a serial connector down the rail to make it all work. I drilled out an exit hole for the cabling, as near to the pivot as possible to reduce drag. I then added the appropriate connectors to the ends. Then the cables were run through the gearbox and tied down along the rail spacers. And finally, connectors were added to the other ends of the cables. And then I could finally mount the motor and plug it all in. The pivots need some encoders to provide us with information about the joint positions. And I'm using AS5600 sensors, which can read the position of a magnet to determine rotation angle. And this means I need a mount for the encoder, and I need a little cap that will hold the magnet at the pivot. I'm not going to use it immediately, but the pan axis will also get an encoder so we can keep track of the pan angle as well. And for the brains behind this rig, I'm going to use an ESP32, mostly because it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, and I want to use that later. So I hacked together a quick prototype on some perfboard, and mostly this is just to add some isolators for communicating with the O-Drives, and an SD card slot that we'll need for capturing our position data in the future. And all of this got wired together onto the pivot. I'm skipping the pan encoder for now, since I don't need it for these first steps and I already have enough to integrate. So I greased up the gears, got the motor spinning, bolted on the pivot brake, and mounted the rails on the pivot. So now it's time for software, and this is the part that I've been somewhat dreading. And first up is some sort of homing sequence. And essentially what I'm doing is ramming the carriages against the end stop at slow speed and measuring the rise in current. When it spikes, the controller knows the carriage is at the end of travel. Next, the camera and the counterweight are mounted up to their respective carriages. And this is where one of the benefits of doing it in software starts to become apparent. I really don't need to worry about matching the counterweight to the camera. The counterweight just needs to be greater than the camera, and the software can compensate by moving the carriage a smaller distance. So now the two carriages are moved to the center of travel and weights are added to the end of the jib until it balances level. 
but without some kind of stabilization, we're seeing the exact same problem as the previous model. The jib just wants to return to level when tilted away from its balance point, and the problem gets worse the more it's tilted. And essentially, again, what we're seeing is the offset of the center of mass on a vertical axis. So we have our center of mass currently is in line with the pivot horizontally, but because the camera is hanging so far down, what we're seeing is probably somewhere around here is where the actual center of mass is lying. So it's time to talk about stabilization. And I know many of you are already screaming just to add a PID loop. And if you're unfamiliar, this is just an algorithm that lets you tune a system to a desired set point. And in this case, that set point is based on the feedback from the tilt sensor. So essentially, the PID loop finds the perfect position for the counterweight for any given angle by moving the counterweight around and reading the feedback from the tilt sensor. And yeah, adding this PID control does allow the jib to remain level at a set angle. And it allows us to slide the carriages back and forth without greatly disrupting that angle. But when you start to dive into it, there's a lot more to the problem than what a simple PID control can solve. For example, how does the jib differentiate between unintentional movement, which the jib should correct for, versus the intentional movement that the jib should adapt to effortlessly? You definitely don't want it fighting you as you try to reposition it, which is exactly what happens when I try to move it around. So I think with a lot of tuning, the PID loop could get us close. But I have another idea for how to solve the problem. And to do it, I'm going to borrow a little something from the film industry. So in cinematography, we use something called a lookup table or LUT as a quick shortcut when setting the color of an image. And basically this LUT is just a matrix of numbers in a grid. So this idea can be used for all sorts of things besides color. So here's my thought. While the act of stabilization isn't so great at moving the jib around in real time, it is perfectly fine to hold the jib stable at a fixed angle. So what we can do is set the jib for a variety of angles and camera positions, and we can fill out our own grid with all these values. So I created a calibration routine of sorts. It starts by setting the stabilization for a high angle and measuring two different camera positions for this angle. And at each camera position, the optimal counterweight position is measured and recorded. And then it repeats this process for a variety of different angles, both above and below the pivot, to fill in the rest of the points in our grid. And once this is all filled out, we can interpolate between these values to determine the position of the counterweight. And this takes a while, but patience pays off. I can now turn off the PID control and go into interpolation mode. And now the jib actually functions as a jib. I can position and hold the jib at any angle and the counterweight just moves to the optimal position to keep the jib balanced at that angle. And I can slide the camera carriage in and out and once again, the jib will automatically find the best counterweight position to keep it all balanced. Now this is far from perfect. For one thing, the jib doesn't have a way to counter the moment force that's generated as the carriages start to accelerate. So it does tend to drift at the start and stop of a move. And yeah, the calibration is very, very slow. But I already have a lot of ideas for how this can be tweaked in software. And most importantly, I now have a platform that allows for all sorts of future experimentation. And while the functionality is a bit limited at the moment, I'm already working on a whole bunch of tweaks that will hopefully open up all sorts of new features. And the slider jib does work well enough to give me the functionality I needed to achieve my initial goal, since all the Bamboo Labs B-roll was shot using it. And so far it's kind of awesome for time-lapse and real-time moves alike. And new software is going to unlock all sorts of new functionality. But unfortunately that's all the time I have for this video. But you can definitely expect more from this design in the future. I'm going to hold off for now on releasing the plans and the code until I have a chance to refine things. But check my Patreon for future updates. And while you're there, consider supporting the channel and get access to pre-release videos and exclusive content. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks again to Bamboo Labs for sponsoring this video. If you're in the market for a 3D printer, I really can't recommend them enough. Click the link in the description to help support the channel. And if you like this video, consider clicking another right there.